So our first speaker today is Tony Rosenfeld, chef and co-founder of Be Good, a growing fast casual concept. Before starting Be Good, Tony worked as a chef at several iconic Boston restaurants after stents in Florence and Rome. When he's not at the stove, Tony also spreads his love of good food as a writer, contributing to many leading publications. So this morning, he'll give us kind of a from the trenches report on how today's new whole fast food restaurants are thriving, and he'll share why whole grains are the default in his 40 stores. How am I doing? Audio okay? All right, so uh, full, disclo full disclosure, I'm a chef by trade. There is no reason I should have a PowerPoint in my hands nor a pointer, so bear with me. I'm much better on, on a kitchen line than I am with this sort of thing. So uh, just to get going a little bit, Be Good. Anybody out there know about Be Good? Ever heard of Be Good? All right. I'm going to take that as a very big win. So I think we had about five people in this audience. Um, for the most part, we are, well, before getting to there, um, we are fast food. I know the words fast food have really interesting connotations. Um, at best, they're negative. And our goal uh, since starting in 2004 was to try to change the way that we think about fast food. Because in and of itself, uh, preparing food quickly for folks that are on the go uh, could be something that, that really can work. Uh, but obviously, the bones and structure of said uh, industry were broken. So um, those are our standard fare right there. You do have a burger, and that was kind of the way we always started. We wanted to do burgers right. Uh, but as you can see, too, there's green smoothies and there's salads, and that's kind of been um, how we've continued to evolve and really grow the business. Um, these are the mumbo jumbo uh, slides that I got from the folks in marketing. Uh, so just the same way I should not have a clicker in my hand or PowerPoint, uh, I'm the last guy that can read bar graphs. Fortunately, these are simple. Um, currently, we have 45 restaurants. Most of them are on the East Coast. Um, that number, I think we want to be 60 by the end of two, 2016. If that can be believed, we actually are going to get there. Um, and I think my head's going to explode simultaneously. So uh, a, a lot of pressure. Um, as you can see, uh, over the last many years, not only have our restaurants grown, uh, but we, you know, the way they do and how successful they are has also grown. And I think um, as we go along through this presentation, I think we'll be able to, to key on the fact that, among other things, whole grains have been essential in our growth. So just a little bit more before kind of digging into the food itself. Uh, my, one of my partners, John, is the one that hands, handles a lot of our marketing. Um, and when we first started up, I think the key uh, for us was how we defined ourselves. And I think that's tricky. Defining yourselves can kind of create things that, that limit you as well. Um, I think what he really wanted to focus on, and I think is something that we've lived by ever since, uh, is real food. And real foods has all sorts of levels, but I think primarily what it speaks to um, is transparency and in ingredients, uh, most notably with the sourcing. Uh, in terms of that map that you just saw on the previous slide, uh, each region, we, we have a very regional approach. We, we, we land in there and we try and find all the different local elements that we can to kind of produce our menu. Um, as it pertains to New England, which is where we started, uh, you can see that whether it's the beef coming from up in Maine, the cheese coming from Cabot in Vermont, uh, potatoes, uh, many of them from, from Massachusetts, uh, we, our goal and, and <clears throat> one of my primary goals in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, in addition to building on the menu, is helping make these connections and find folks that can, can bring to us great local uh, there and ingredients. So anyways, enough of kind of the, the marketing slides. Um, let's go back in terms of how did a Be Good menu kind of evolve. Um, and as you can see there, uh, 
I was a bad man at age five. I, I had that bike, and uh, <laughs> the two things I wanted to focus on this slide, because they have nothing to do with whole grains, but I think they're fascinating. One is if, you know, upon putting this together, if you look at that front tire on that bike, I've, I have no idea how my parents thought that was a good idea for that to be my first training bike. Um, the second is the drawstrings on my brother's uh, pants. I don't, I don't think they do drawstrings on pants like that anymore. So anyways, I grew up in the 80s. I was a child of the 80s. Um, and because of it, uh, I tended to think of food in, in two very different categories. They were the things that I really desperately wanted, uh, that I spent many years pushing my poor mother to uh, the brink of insanity, trying to figure out ways to get. And then there were the things that I mostly got. Uh, so if you look at what I wanted, um, cookie crisp, I, I honestly, to this day, I never got to eat cookie crisp, and that's a great regret. Um, <laughs> but the idea of cookies for breakfast um, was just you know, too, too good to be believed. Um, there was a McDonald's at Soldier Field Road. Uh, I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. There were two McDonald's uh, in 1980. Um, one of the things that, as I was kind of trying to put this together, the, the, the strongest case for just how important McDonald's was in my life, uh, we off, often only ended up in McDonald's when somebody got deathly sick because it was close to the pediatrician. Uh, so some of my good memories are of somebody getting sick and us eating McDonald's after. <laughs> Um, and it really was a special, it was a special thing. But that said, in, in all honesty, um, you know, fast food was, was starting to kind of become as we know it, and it, it, was, it was a force, and, um, and obviously for young people, it was something that we kind of lusted after. Um, finally, you know, the other thing, Hostess, kind of up in the New England area, uh, where I grew up was was just this incredible. <laughs> it was this incredible uh, something that we all strive to find one way or another. Especially as we got old enough to have money in our pockets. So what did I get? Um, the the first thing that you know I I recall all too often was kasha and bow ties. My mother made kasha and bow ties incessantly, um, and I think we all look back at our youth and we thank our parents for different things. I could not be more surprised that this is something I'm going to thank her for. But um, I actually, at the time, that we were three boys. There were groans. There was unhappiness. And mostly the question of, like, that's what we have to eat for dinner tonight. Um, I also happen to have two wonderful Jewish grandmothers. Um, and they would uh, jet in for a week every couple of months. And those were better received. We used to get stuffed cabbage from my nana. Um, we used to get cinnamon buns uh, from my grandmother, among other things. Um, and the thing that we usually got, and although it's my last name, it's, it's a different, different family. But instead of those hostess cupcakes, which honestly never set foot in my house growing up, we, we got Rosenfeld's bagels, which, which were pretty darn good. Um, so anyways, that's kind of the backdrop to, to how we eat. Um, a lot of that fast food I still have a very soft spot for in, in food memories. Um, but if you fast forward, uh, you know, about 20 years, uh, we were clearly in a different spot. And, and so was the way people started to look at eating. Um, so the idea behind Be Good, um, if you look on the left side picture, you can see uh, those are my two partners. Uh, John on the left deals with marketing. Anthony deals with the business side. And I'm the food guy. The guy in the middle is, is Uncle Fares. Uh, and for the four, first five or six years of our, of our existence at Be Good, and for the many years before, he was kind of our guiding light. Um, for, for my two uh, partners, he was the one that made homemade food in their house. And so I think when we, when we banded together and we decided we're going to create this thing, um, Uncle Ferris was kind of the benchmark, the idea of creating good, healthy, fast food that people could eat. Um, the goal all along was to take the traditional fast food menu and try to up, update it, upgrade it, make it you know, something that would work. At the time when we started Be Good, this was only five years ago. No, it was actually a lot longer, but I'd like it to be five. Uh, we were all about 28 years old. Um, so you know, it was, it, we, we'd been in the work world. I'd been cooking. They'd been in the business world. And we said, 
there's got to be something better. Let's go and do it. So we, we, we did. We were idealistic. We were really passionate. Um, and the thought was, let's just take everything that's traditional about fast food and try and make it better, try and make it real. So when we opened our first Be Good in 2004, which is, is a long time ago now, it feels like, there was a lot going on. Um, so, uh, fast Food Nation had been written in 2001. I, I don't know if folks recall it, um, but it was, it was really staggering. It was beautifully written. Um, at, this, at the time that I was putting together this slide, for some reason in my mind, Omnivore's Dilemma had, had, was already around, but it actually was a couple years before Omnivore's Dilemma. So Fast Food Nation was, was just uh, really a treatise on what was going on in fast food and so many of the problems behind it. Uh, and I think it was, it was a guiding principle uh, in terms of how we wanted to approach the food. Super Size Me, um, I don't know if folks saw that movie, um, it was cool for us because for whatever reason, Morgan Spurlock was one of our first customers. Uh, he was a New York guy, but he would come up to Boston, uh, and it was really, really neat. Uh, so we, you know, being able to talk to him, get a sense of what he was up to, and also having him like what we were up to. So from, uh, from you know, what was being seen and watched, those were two important items. Uh, we, we had a couple of models, um, most, most notably Chipotle. Um, in 2004 in Boston, there was not a Chipotle to be had. So we would talk about it incessantly, read articles, and eventually make some trips around just to try it. The thing that was so essential and tremendous about Chipotle um, was that they were working with, with natural meats from Nyman. Um, and at the time, that seemed, you know, that was unheard of. And it was, it was really cool, and it was something that we wanted to emulate, although we had absolutely no idea how. Um, and obviously, Shake Shack, um, not something that we were you know, terribly familiar with right in 2004, but it was clear there was folks that were starting to think about fast food and, and how we could improve it. So as we're getting ready to kind of open our doors, I think the first and foremost goal was we got to do this right. We got to source this locally. Um, you know, I come from, a, fa from a, a fine dining background where it's easy to get a whole animal into your kitchen, even back then in 2004. Uh, how we're going to get locally sourced vegetables and potatoes and bread and, and even more importantly beef into our restaurant with very little experience on that sourcing front, that was a big mystery. Um, and <clears throat> through a lot of conversations, through driving places, to the point of people telling us, please give me a break so I can get my work done today. Uh, I think we started to create some really tremendous relationships. Um, I, won't, I won't, you know, lie. Each one of these relationships with these gentlemen, um, they, took, they took a year, two, to develop. Um, there was a lot that went into them, especially as we had one restaurant and two restaurants. Uh, it wasn't easy to set up that supply chain, but sourcing locally, was always goal one. The other thing that quickly became apparent uh, was that we were growing up, and at this point I was probably 28 or 29, I was starting to realize that my mom was actually really smart and a really great mother. You know, we're doing that thing that we all do, that as we're in that place where you start saying, holy God, mother, you, you really should have been serving me that. I can't believe I was so mean to you about that. that, that. So I was at that point where, and taste buds are funny, but you start remembering actually missing something that you desperately did not like about 10 or 15 years ago as a kid. So the, the kasha and bow ties thing that was, was starting to germinate in my head is something that I really wanted us to work on. The other element that was most definitely key our customers were growing up. They were reading the same things that we were reading. They, were, they knew Fast Food Nation. Um, they were seeing the studies. They were understanding that some of the traditional fast food was not doing really good things for us as a country and as individuals. So salads, um, we, you know, although we had this idea to open this incredible burger chain with salads, what we realized uh, were, was that salads were really what was moving the business, that salads uh, were key to what we do. The second thing we realized um, for three 28, late 20-something 20 uh, males, uh, in, in the surprise of all surprises, 
uh, women were a fundamental part of our business. They, they formed about 65% uh, percent of our customer base. Um, and through no, you know, through no thought or planning on our own, it had just happened that they had vibed with the message that we were sharing. Um, and then the other, the final thing was clearly um, every survey that we con conducted, nutrition w was a primary essential element of what we were up to and what people were enjoying. Um, so it was something that was more of kind of like a goal and part of this business model. It, was, it, it had become far more. So the result of all these factors, of, of what was being written around us, about the studies that were going on with obesity, about what, who we found out were our, our customers and what was important for our customers about our business, um, I think there were three really key takeaways that healthfulness, as I mentioned, you know, when we first started off, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a downer to say, hey, we want to create really healthy food. People glaze over. Uh, a lot of times they think that, that that's a trade-off for actual flavor. Um, so I think what we realized was that although we might want, not want to call it simply healthy food, um, that it really was a mission to try to create something that in every way, shape, and form was, was nourishing uh, and better than the alternatives. Um, another element that became completely clear uh, was that we needed to be transparent, um, that there's plenty of brands and concepts out there that no good marketing can, can be created by saying buzzwords. Uh, but to go the next level, whether it was on the sourcing front um, with who we were working with locally, uh, or whether it was on the ingredient front and really starting to get into the things, whether they be f the fruits and vegetables or, and, and more importantly as we get along to this, the whole grains that kind of form the base uh, for a lot of our ingredients. And so that was just the final piece, that uh, <clears throat> to be as sophisticated uh, as necessary so that our customers, we could have an, a, a real dialogue, a real communication about what they were eating. Because uh, I think a veggie burger can only do so much. I think at a certain point, somebody that's eating it three times a week wants to know what's in it, and they want to be able to really feel good about it. So, so in terms of, I've broken down our kind of journey at Be Good uh, into three parts. Um, one was part one, and I think you know started at 2004, but it was something that we continued to evolve. Um, we started with the grains baked in. Um, so for the most part, grains were not standalones in, in salads. They weren't standalones in the bowls that were to come. They were things that were baked into a couple of our essential menu items. Uh, the first was our bread. Uh, and we talked with all sorts of bakeries, um, but soon realized that if we were going to kind of have the impact that we wanted, um, as easy as it would be to have a very nondescript light, you know, whole wheat slash really white bun, um, we were going to have to do something that was more. And it was going to have to be something that had substance and, and, and really packed with whole grains. So that was one element. And then the second was a veggie burger, that we had to create a veggie, veggie burger because we were a burger restaurant, uh, but we were quickly realizing um, that people were focused on a lot more than beef. So in terms of the first piece, creating a good whole grain burger bun ain't easy. Um, and I know, because we tried. Um, I, you know, as much as I do love to bake, I'm no baker. But I think what, what we realized is um, try and look for good whole grain buns. And they, you know, they can be lacking. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. In terms of what goes into our standard be good spec, um, and we don't have one universal spec. We work with, with uh, regional bakers, uh, and we try and kind of create something that works for them, but it is also kind of true to what we're looking for. If you look at all that stuff, though, um, again, not being a baker, but just being somebody that understands the laws of physics, uh, buckwheat, millet, millet flaxseed, rye, oats, stone ground, whole wheat flour, they're heavy. Um, and so to create something that would be, have all those ingredients and have um, 
certainly the nutrients and the, and the dietary fiber that we were looking for. Um, those are all things that are kind of a baker's worst nightmare in terms of weighing down something that you want to be delicate. Um, so we, we reached out to a lot of local bakeries um, and they were interesting conversations. They were demanding um, because I think if, you know, the way I feel about a lot of Be Goods food, if, if things just existed readily out there and they were easy, um, then most everybody would be doing it. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the most important, the best things, obviously take a process. There's, there's a lot of, you know, blood, sweat, and tears that kind of go into it. On this front, I think we were, we've been really lucky because we, we've been able to find artisan bakers that believe in what we're up to, and I think they've created tremendous pro, uh, products. Um, very early on, we got slammed by a, a notable food blogger who, who explained that a perfect burger needs a very soft white bun. The, the burger needs to be griddled in its own fat, slice of American cheese, maybe a piece of iceberg, smush it together. That is the perfect burger, and these guys don't know what they're doing. Um, so love that blog, by the way. That was really well received. Um, but no, I think what, what you realize with that blog, which was interesting, um, is if you do set out to do what, what, we're, what you're going to do, you're going to have many people in the know, smart people, people that are, you know, that, that, whose business is to say what is the perfect burger in Boston um, and, and kind of how they, how they review that. So we did get some of those emails. Those emails kind of bummed me out. But I think what you quickly realize, and I'm sure many in, in each of your walks of life uh, can see it, when you want to go about doing something the right way, there's going to be all sorts of, all sorts of ways that it's received. Um, I think you have to understand that if you're true to your ideals, um, the goal is to hit the people that you really are trying to hit and hopefully win over some others. And the, the nasty blog emails saying that this is the densest bun I ever ate or whatnot, um, I think you, you listen to it and you keep moving forward. So that was the work on our whole grain bun. And those are all bakeries we're still using today. More we're looking for. Um, I think of, of the great pride and joy I have in, in what we've done at Be Good, um, for me it's an honor to work with, with bakers like this. It, it really is. We're a burger restaurant. We don't kid ourselves, but to have really, truly, tremendously high-end bakeries um, and have them plastered across our walls because we are so proud, um, to me that is, is just something that's extraordinary. Uh, so the second piece of this, this whole grains part one, uh, where all of our grains are being kind of baked in, uh, was the veggie burger. When my partners in 2004 said, we need a veggie burger on the menu, um, I had grade, uh, grave misgivings. Um, I have always related to veggie burgers as, as things that were in a frozen case uh, that people reheat in a toaster oven and then say it's not that bad. Um, is usually, that's usually the benchmark. Um, or it's actually pretty good. And, and none of those are things that if you uh, take every meal as, as though it might be your last, that, that doesn't necessarily, is, is the approach that sounds super appetizing. Um, so I think the one really big thing that we had um, when we were going to create th this veggie burger one, or, or chief among them, was that it really should be vegetables in a veggie burger. No offense to folks that are, that are creating, you know, non-meat ingredients that actually taste like meat and, and have a texture like meat. Um, but our mission was to create real food. It was to create um, items that were full of real ingredients um, and trying to kind of pull a bait and switch with, with ingredients that might be able to be construed as pretty darn close to meat uh, was not super appealing. So in terms of what we, we put in the veggie burger, we kind of put the kitchen sink. Um, in terms of my PowerPoint skills, I, I could have thrown about 30 other things on this slide, but I, 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 I worry how it would have looked. But the, the bases um, were brown rice and bulgur, uh, um, wild rice as, as, the, uh, as, as the base grains. Um, we also add all sorts of beans. We also, also add all sorts of vegetables. Um, one of the early things that we, we kind of got pushback from our customers on was needing for this to be uh, vegan. And 
you know, up until that point for the first year or so, we were using egg, and egg is the most wonderful thing to make, uh, to bind, and, and I miss it dearly. Uh, but what I, what I learned, um, and this was part of my own education process, is that flaxseed is its own little incredible ingredient, and it can do great things. And so what we learned to do was puree some of these beans and use flaxseed and create this little paste. Um, the one thing that I would underline uh, is, is at the bottom, which uh, I think truly for a good veggie burger, um, if you're not going the route of, of reheating um, something that's been frozen, I, I think there, there's three pieces that we learned to make our veggie burger work. Um, one is that it needed to be kind of loose. Um, uh, it's, it's one thing to create something that's slightly indestructible using breadcrumbs or using anything else to make it good and dense. It makes a really strong patty that tastes like breadcrumbs. Um, so I think what we realized is that we wanted this to be loose. We wanted it to be full of the textures of the whole grains, and we wanted it to be full of vegetables. Um, to do that, the, the second piece that we had to do <clears throat> was sear all those many veggie burgers that we were creating during busy lunch services. We had to sear them well. Um, you put it on the flat top, you let it sit, and so I'm talking about a flat top griddle, um, which is almost performed like, like cast iron in terms of retaining its heat and searing well. Has to has to be there for about two minutes. You get a beautiful crust, you can flip it, and it, it does perform like a veggie burger. Um, that took many sleepless nights and arguing with our operations people and begging and then telling them, I'm stupid, but please do this anyways, and, and all sorts of back and forth, it worked. Um, and, and our veggie burger became an essential part of, of our burger menu, um, which is a real win. The only other piece, obviously, is that you go and you create this incredible sear on a veggie burger, you flip it, and you create an, an, another incredible sear. Uh, the next thing has to happen is that that goes on that whole grain bun out to the customer, um, sitting around and letting it sit in, in a warming trail. Uh, in a warming drawer was never really an option. So those were the two primary, you know, s s iteration one, if you will, of, of how Be Good dealt with um, whole grains. So whole grain part two, <clears throat> I actually think I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit off on that. I think it started up around 2012. So we've been in business for about eight years. We created a menu that, as I mentioned, salads darn near outsold our burgers. Um, veggie burgers were is almost as big a seller as beef. And we created something that was really working. Um, but we also could see that there was all sorts of better burger restaurants opening out there, and you know, you know the ones. Um, and they were doing dynamite. And I think what we realized is we saw a fork in the road, and I think what we decided was we wanted to keep on doubling down on uh, what we were doing, not only with the sourcing front, but also with the whole, whole grain front. So part two uh, on, on our journey to whole grain enlightened them uh, was to work with the grains in the actual, the, the grains standalone. So not being buried in, in a piece of bread and not being buried uh, in a veggie burger patty, but actually on their own. So this is our avocado lime bowl. Um, it continues to be on the menu. Um, the things that sell incredibly well are always still a surprise to me, because I actually think that there's things in our menu that are better, but hey, if this is what they like, that's tremendous. So it is our number one at every single Be Good of those 45 Be Good restaurants. It universally is a top seller. It almost outsells other things by, by um, uh, about two to one. In terms of <clears throat> the formula, first, um, in every one of those bowls, there is... Uh, there, there's an option. So the customer, when they approach our point of sale and order a bowl, they have one or two options. They can get a quinoa mix or they can get a super grains mix. Um, I think the sales on it are approximately 50 to 50. So that's our equivalent of asking, do you want white or wheat on your burger bun? Um, <clears throat> the, the quinoa blend is simple. It's just red and white quinoa. We go a little bit heavier on the white quinoa because White quinoa's uh, texture is a little bit more forgiving, uh, and it, it just makes for a better all-around product. On the super grains, there's a lot in there. 
Um, we use uh, a couple different forms of quinoa. We use a sushi brown rice, so that it's kind of a medium grain uh, and holds up nicely. We use millet, not a ton, um, because we want it in there, but we don't want it to overpower. We use kamut. <clears throat> not sure how many people are familiar with kamut, but it's, it's one of those uh, heirloom wheat uh, uh, grains. And also we use wheat berries. We use hard red wheat berries. So we create this mix um, that we're describing as a super grains. Um, <clears throat> the one thing uh, that I learned, have or never really worked in, in an Asian restaurant kitchen, um, we, uh, about five years ago, we had zero rice cookers in our restaurants. We have so many rice cookers, I don't know how many count. Um, rice cookers are a thing of beauty. I know many of you know that at home, um, where it's just a press of the button and it can mean that a side is created really nicely. In the, a commercial restaurant kitchen, they are a saving grace <clears throat> because, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so with 45 restaurants and eating to produce, <clears throat> 45 restaurants needing to produce grains that, that work and are cooked perfectly. Um, the only option really is a white rice cooker. The other thing that's really tremendous about rice cookers uh, is their powers of reheating. Uh, and that's something that basically operationally allows us what we need to do on a given basis. I'm sure many of you are looking at me and saying this is a great story, but in my kitchen, wherever it might be, um, the real nitty gritty, thank you. The real nitty gritty is how can I produce this consistently day in and day out. Um, and I have no stock in any rice cooker company. Um, if any of you are selling, I'll buy. Because really, they really do all sorts of wonderful things. Um, in terms of in, a little bit more about the actual bowls. Um, and I just, well, I'll get there in a second. But in terms of what goes into our grain bowls, they're basically three levels. Um, the, bottom, the bottom layer is the grains, whether it be the super grain mix or that quinoa mix. Um, and it usually serves as the base of each and every one in bowl. Uh, the second piece is kale. Uh, we normally, uh, on a daily basis, we uh, stem the kale, we slice it superbly thinly, and then we marinate it with olive oil and a little bit of lemon. The result is the kale looks something like seaweed in terms of a seaweed salad, slightly moist and soft um, and, and you know, pleasant. The, the next level are sauteed vegetables. Um, and so while on the line, we are making that bottom layer, we have somebody over at our grill station who is using high heat to grill these vegetables as well as a couple of others, broccoli, green beans might make appearances. Um, but one of the essential pieces to making this work uh, is that there be kind of browned saute vegetables that have that mylard reaction going on that add um, some real intense flavor on top. The final layer uh, is usually a lot of colors and a lot of homemade sauces. Um, so legumes will make an appearance. Uh, we use pretty much every bean imaginable uh, on the top. We also use um, legumes in the form of nuts, uh, which add great texture and obviously health benefits. And there's, there's usually some sort of, of homemade sauce. None of what you're looking at up there is actually one of the homemade sauces. I just got desperate for something that would fit in this PowerPoint. Um, so that's, that in and of itself is the formula. Um, and I just want to go back. Let's see how well I can go back. If you look at kind of where our sales change, sorry about that picture of me again, um, you'll see that the bowls really got introduced right around 2013. Um, and many, many stores saw increases of approximately 25% per store. Uh, so as much as we had created a nice little business uh, up, up in you know, our first six, seven years of business, what really happened um, was those bowls added an extra category, an extra element, and something that was obviously something that was going on currently in the, in the, in the, 
in the food industry, uh, it was something that we really focused on and created special. So, in terms of, so th there really are three keys to our grain bowls. Oh gosh, there's actually four keys. My math just <laughs> kind of faltered. Uh, but in terms of how they work, I described a little bit about the formula. Um, but I think, and to me, this slide might actually be key to food service in general and to what we're able to do. Uh, because I think a lot of what works on this slide is not something that I can do or have time to do. And it's not something that a lot of our folks at, at home have time to do. So I think it's an advantage. One is creating bright colors. Um, and that, that kind of, you know, it goes without saying, all, all chefs are trying to create things that are pretty and colorful. Um, but I think the, the paradigm shift, what, what really applies here and makes it different, is on the bottom of this bowl are quinoa and super grains. And while there are many of our customers might have been standing in line already ready, excuse me, already led, ready for us to create something with kale and, and, and super grains and, and quinoa, uh, I think there was another good many who were just ready to try it and, and hope that it tasted really good so that they could go home and tell their spouse, I ate something really good today. Let's eat steak or whatever it is that they're going to eat at home. So in terms of bright colors was one. Contrasting textures was two. Um, again, you know, most all folks that are in the food service industry know it's no great secret that if there's soft grains on the bottom of this, uh, we certainly want to have disparate, uh, disparate textures. The, the whole bowl could be interesting and not simply a one bite. Um, technique, I'm going to get back to after the big flavors. Um, if you look at these, uh, a lot of them, the Power Bowl is, is something that's meant to be kind of earthy. Um, there's a roasted tomato vinaigrette in there, uh, and it's, it's something that's kind of Mediterranean in base. The farm sand tomato basil, a fresh basil vinaigrette. The curry and grilled avocado, um, a slightly spicy curry sauce, and the avocado lime. Uh, spicy chipotle salsa mixing with grilled corn and queso fresco in lime. Um, all of these, and I think that was one of the essential parts to, to our success. Um, I think if we were going to make food that could be connoted as, as being healthy, um, I think we were all dead set that we would much rather create something that was full of really bold flavors, even possibly a little too spicy, a little too sour. Uh, and so I think the, the one other big piece, in a, and I'm going to kind of work to, to pull this all together, uh, the one essential element was health food as we think of it often includes a spa and a retreat or a cleanse and things that sound painful. Um, so the idea that we could create something uh, that certainly had tremendously healthy elements, uh, but would also be big on flavor, I think was, was really the way that we wanted to go. And if we wanted to make a mistake, I'd rather have folks say, well, <laughs> that was spicier than I thought or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, so I'm going to get right towards the end um, here, so we'll maybe get a couple of questions and move on to the next. Um, I love this slide. It's, it's grain field with, with kind of a sunrise slash sunset, um, kind of what is the future for, for grains that be good. There's currently a menu category I'm working on. Um, it's, it's similar to what we, do, what we did with the plates, um, but I want grains to kind of be part of these little salads. Uh, it, it is building on the small plates uh, phenomena, which has obviously been around for a bit, but probably not really much in the fast casual. Uh, the idea creating uh, cold salads, vegetable salads, legume salads, grain salads. Um, we have them at one restaurant, and we're going to be launching it at a second. And uh, I don't sleep at night because I check the sales every day, rooting for the sales to be really great. Fortunately, the sales have been really great, so now I'm just stressed about the next restaurant. But that's, that's one of the big things. Um, the only other piece, and this is my final slide, um, I think if, if I personally have a goal with, with kind of how grains appear in their next steps, their next iteration, um, I think 
you know, we do carry a super grain. Uh, we have a power bowl. Those are bu buzzwords and nutritionism words that obviously sell to that person at 11 o'clock or 11.30 that's in line saying, man, <laughs> I just worked out, I wanna get big or, or whatever it is or, it's, or, or, or summer weather's coming up and I wanna get ready for the beach. Um, but my goal would be to continue to see us transition out of a short sales kind of pitch that some of these things offer and get into the, you know, some of the cooking, some of the foods that are real and authentic and traditional. Uh, and so if I think there is a final frontier, um, I think the next level of being mainstream about some of these items is that they be true and authentic dishes and that people be eating them because hopefully the education level has happened such that people already know that those quinoa grains and those power grains, they are power grains and now it's just simply about the food. Uh, and continuing to evolve it in our flavored taste buds. I, I'm sure I've gone way over. I hope uh, you've enjoyed the talk. Um, all right, I know we have a question up here. Chef, awesome presentation. I gotta tell you, I'm old. I've been in the industry forever, and I'm ashamed to say I'm not familiar with Be Good. And, and now I just, I'm in love with you, and I wanna eat you up. Here's a question I want to ask you, though, because it's obviously part of your marketing, successful marketing, is, is an emphasis on local, right? I mean, I was, you're getting your potatoes from Massachusetts, not Idaho, you know, for the Northeast. So here's my question is, because it, it, local has, that has evolved as an issue, especially with culinarians over the last several years, and of course also with customers, and the customers are driving that. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of defining what local is, I mean, there are plenty of chefs and restaurants out there who would be fine with a restaurant in Massachusetts serving potatoes from Idaho because it's within the contiguous 48 states. And you, on the other hand, have really taken that very um, dedicated penetration of local, and I love it, I love it. But here's what I don't understand, or I just want some uh, perspective from you. As whole grains, interest in whole grains is growing, and, and you are obviously leading you know, innovation and, and um, uh, creating more awareness and education uh, and demand. Where is the line drawn from when a whole grain is local I mean, nobody in Massachusetts has grown quinoa, are they? No. Um, so why is that okay? That's so, my question. So, so there's, a, there's a couple great questions there. Um, I think if I could add a, a final slide, and I'm, I'm sure you guys are grateful that I didn't, but if I could have, I think the other final frontier, and it's something that we're working on, uh, especially um, with some folks in Maine that have grains that we desperately want access to. I think the final frontier, um, obviously most uh, quinoa at a, at a massive scale comes uh, from Peru and Bolivia. And uh, as wonderful as the grain is, that's, that's a lot to travel. That's a big carbon footprint. Um, so to answer your question, that is something that I'm working really hard on because I think uh, it does matter. There's plenty of mills in Massachusetts. There, there's plenty of mills up in, in, in Maine. And, and so we are, that's ongoing. And I, it's something that Next year when we do this, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna show you all the different grains that we're working with. Um, as far as quinoa, there is, for our stores in Canada, there's a Canadian quinoa, it's a, a golden quinoa, um, which we are going to unleash in the next couple of weeks. It's gonna be a really interesting case study because golden quinoa, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with it, it's something that I've just gotten to learn. The flavor's a little bit more assertive and aggressive, uh, so it would certainly be something that would do right by the mission. To answer your question though, on the, on the macro uh, level, I, I do think it's gonna be essential. Um, a, a, a local tomato now or, or local cauliflower, which, what we're, which we're getting onto our menu, in comparison, they're kind of sexy compared to hard red wheat berries uh, in terms of a customer, how they appreciate it. I think the next level and the next iteration will certainly be to, to, to take that on. Thank you. And I know some of our friends at Lundberg here are working on the American grown quinoa, so you'll have to talk to them as well. Um, I think I'm going to roll into our next talk, um, but definitely if you uh, want to look for Tony at the break and ask him more questions.